Hegemonic Stability Theory and War, Part 2. So the fourth theory comes from Wallenstein's World Capitalist System and General Wars. Why do status quo states decline and why do challenger states rise? This idea was first developed by Lenin in his book Imperialism and he proposed that the law of uneven growth of states causes war. Relative changes in economic power occurs because of differences in geopolitical positioning, opportunities, inherent natural endowments that permit optimal exploitation of the current or emerging manufacturing technology. For Wallenstein, the operation of the world capitalist system explains the uneven development economically of the world states. Essentially, the world economy travels through a series of stages and at each subsequent stage undergoes three transformations. First, there's a qualitative change which occurs in the type of predominant capitalism. Second, there's a geographic increase in the number of participants in the global economic system, as in the division of labor which extends itself to outlying societies who are not previously engaged. Third, at each stage, a state either has its particular role confirmed or changed. And these roles are either core, meaning the leading financial and manufacturing states, semi-peripheral, which are states that are in the process of development or are slightly less wealthy, or periphery, which are the states that provide primary agricultural and other resources. Core states dominate the system and exploit weaker and less technologically developed semi-peripheral and peripheral states. The transformations occurred in all four stages of world capitalism. In stage one of agricultural capitalism began as a consequence of accidental technological and ecological conditions in Europe that led to the collapse of feudalism in the 14th and 15th centuries, in which Western Europe was the core. Eastern Europe and the New World were the periphery, and the Mediterranean were the semi-periphery, after having declined from being the core. After the final defeat of the Habsburgs in 1557, the system became nearly impossible to unbalance. Now this stage was dominated by the Portuguese, the Spanish, and the Dutch. The second stage emerged from a system-wide recession of 1650 to 1730 and resulted in a new mode of capitalism focused on mercantilism, with its emphasis on the need for colonies. This period was contested by the Dutch, the English, and the French. Stage three was industrial capitalism, and this saw the expansion of the European world economy and the absorption of subsystems. Within this stage, changes in the mode of production eventually led to the obsolescence of slavery, and semi-peripheral states tended to engage in mercantilist type activity to offset the advantages of core states. The British dominated this period. In stage four, there's a consolidation of industrial capitalism with a further change of the mode of production and the consequent erosion of colonialism. Technology diffuses to new states in response to two phenomena. The first, stated briefly, concludes that to maintain a high level of production and associated consumption requires eventual redistribution of the previously withdrawn surplus. This accounts for the gradual expansion of the modes of production in the system and can lead to status changes in individual states or regions in their relationship to the core. For example, the British developed factories, but they then invested resources to build factories elsewhere, and so the technology spread. The British also needed more consumers, and so the workers eventually were allowed to get increased wages and to become consumers. Countries could also increase their status this way. By having more factories, they increase their per capita income, and then they fit into the economic interaction system with the core. The second states that as privileged factions co-opt resistance factions with a portion of the surplus, meaning the wealthier increase the wages of the poor to get them invested into the system, 
While there's a short-run elimination of opposition, in the long term the payoff expectations are increased in the following crisis. This can lead to a search for uncoopted labor or cheap labor from which the privileged can derive surplus. So there's a perpetual pressure to spread investment to poorer and poorer areas in search of cheaper and cheaper labor. And this leads to the diffusion of technology. So the U.S. brought China into the World Trade Organization so that China could ultimately manufacture the goods that the U.S. found too expensive to manufacture within uh, itself. So what's the statistical evidence? Well, economic long waves based on the Kondratiev cycle do correlate with great power war. A Kondratiev cycle is a European pricing index that has fluctuated over the centuries. Goldstein found that half of the general wars began during or at the end of an economic downsizing. Now there are critics. Hans Gunder Frank has argued that Europeans did not initiate the structure of world trade, but rather displaced one in the 15th century that was previously dominated by the Arabs and the Chinese. So, you know, here, this is a very old list from, gosh, it must have been 20 years ago, because here the U.S. GDP is half of what it is today. But it's essentially uh, to show that defense budgets are very closely related to uh, the GDP, the gross domestic product of countries. And therefore, countries that are militarily powerful tend also to be the ones that are economically the most powerful. This is a chart showing relative economic power between 1750 and 2000. And it shows France and Britain in general decline and it shows the rapid rise of the USSR. But subsequently, estimates of Soviet industrialization have been both distorted and exaggerated. When the Cold War ended, virtually all uh, economists halved the size of the Soviet economy. So the Soviet economy was artificially inflated by the perception that uh, it was strong militarily. So you have to be very careful when you examine these kinds of statistics. The sixth general war, the war of the Austrian succession, the war of Jenkins' year, 1739 to 1748. It included all major uh, great powers of the international system. It was a succession crisis that led Austria, supported by England, to be invaded by Prussia, France, Spain, and the German principalities. Austria ultimately prevailed. Britain and France continued their conflict over overseas territories in India and North America. This is the uh, 1743 Spanish-English naval clash. And this is the British fleet during the War of Jenkins' Ear. The Seventh Systemic War is the Seven Years' War, from 1755 to 1763. It included all six great powers of the international system. It was basically Prussia, uh, which was attacked by the Holy Roman Empire, led by Austria, France, Russia, and Sweden, but it ultimately prevailed because of British financial support. The British used the distraction of this war to capture North America and India. You can see in the extreme left, Clive of India, uh, he was the victor at the Battle of Plassey, which was the key victory that put the British in domination of India. The French commander is at the top right, Duplates. And you can see British soldiers at the uh, bottom and the center. Clive was an agent, or rather uh, a, a, a soldier, a senior official of the uh, East India Company. And uh, he was originally started as a goon or basically a gangster in England who ran a local extortion racket and he was so successful the company hired him. So it tells you something about the uh, types of people working in the East India Company. Here you can see uh, Frederick the Great on the uh, top left and the top right and the Prussian soldiers and you can see the map at the bottom. Uh, Frederick the Great was a, a, a very skilled military leader very good at battles and very good at maneuvering and Prussia paid a very severe price because it was terribly outnumbered um, but with uh, leadership and British financial support Prussia prevailed and managed to fight off all its attackers. This is the global situation in 1763 uh, you can see the Spanish and the English and the Portuguese presence in the Americas and the Russian Empire spreading uh, 
um, uh, through uh, the uh, uh, Asian northern mass and you can see the Europeans beginning to establish empires in Asia. You can see the British East India Company in India. So this is a chart of the British Navy's growth between 1603 where they had 42 vessels and 1890 when they had 10 times as many and the rapid growth in the size of the ships and the incredible cost that these ships uh, uh, were. And you can see in 1803, which is when the British were fighting a war against Napoleon, uh, the fleet was almost as expensive as in 1890 when the British were at peace. So maintaining the peace is expensive if you are a hegemon. And this is the uh, map of Pax Britannica, basically the 19th century when the British dominated about 20% of the uh, world's area and about 25% of the world's population all tied together through the British fleet. And what's important there are the black lines, uh, which are trade routes, but also are the principal routes for the underwater telegraph lines, which enabled the British to have instant communications across the globe uh, to their various stations. The Eighth War was the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars from 1792 to 1815. It included all six of the world's great powers. The French Revolution provoked an invasion of France by Austria, Prussia, Britain, Holland, Spain, the Italians, and Russia. France defeated the invasions. Under Napoleon, there was an attempt to invade England, Russia, the Middle East through Egypt, and to build an overseas empire. France was ultimately defeated. An estimated four million lives were lost. You can see in the top right and the bottom the uh, pictures of the Duke of Wellington, who's ultimately to defeat Napoleon uh, one last time. And you can see a British soldier in the bottom left. You can see paintings of Napoleon. Uh, at the uh, bottom right, you can see him pondering just before the Battle of Wagram in 1809. And you can see a map of France and the different areas that uh, resisted the revolution and where the external powers intervened to try to restore the monarchy. Here you can see Napoleon's strategic goals. Napoleon wanted to take Egypt, take over parts of the Middle East, and then move on to British India, and then move on to Australia, as well as to re-secure possession of the valuable Caribbean islands. Ultimately, Napoleon's expedition to Egypt failed and uh, he was unable to threaten British India. Here's Napoleon crossing the Danube in 1809. Here we have uh, at the bottom the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon's greatest victory in 1805 against the Austrians. He essentially uh, uh, tried to flank the Austrians, causing the Austrians to weaken their center, and then he punched the hole through the center. And he used this same method over and over again, but after uh, 15 years of war, uh, other generals had learned this technique and learned how to counter him. You can see also in the top picture Napoleon with the Austrian Emperor after the defeat of the Austrian army. Here's Europe in 1812, and you can see uh, the domination of Central Europe by the French and you have the Austrians and the Prussians. Uh, you can also see in the top right the Battle of Trafalgar 1805, the key battle in which Horatio Nelson destroyed the Spanish-French fleet and ultimately uh, preserved uh, England's freedom of action with its ships to intervene against the war. And ultimately the English were able to intervene in Spain and push Napoleon out and uh, ultimately to defeat Napoleon. Uh, here you can see the uh, Duke of Wellington in the bottom center. Uh, you can see the Battle of Waterloo, which is not the decisive battle. Uh, the Battle of Leipzig was the key battle that defeated Napoleon in Central Europe, and then he withdrew to France and effectively surrendered and was made a prisoner. Then he came back to France, and it was at the Battle of Waterloo, which was the final defeat of Napoleon. But it was not the main defeat, and it wasn't the most, it wasn't the battle which weakened him the most. And you can see in the bottom uh, right the Battle of Waterloo, and you can see the Battle of Waterloo again in the uh, top uh, in the, uh, the this rather the, the top left.
Nine, the First World War, 1914 to 1918. Uh, this was a war that included all eight of the world's great powers. You have the decay of the Austria-Hungarian Empire and German fears of Russian resurgence led to a war in which Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire opposed France, Russia, England, Italy, Japan, and the United States. 17 million lives were lost. War exhausted the European states and led to a power transition towards the United States and Russia. And this was foreseen by the French commentator and traveler de Tocqueville. This is the map of the two different sides in the First World War. The shaded armies are the central powers, the Ottoman Empire, Austria-Hungary, and Germany. And the white color are the allies who fought against them. You can see also Kaiser Wilhelm, the leader of the Germans. Here again is a depiction of the war in Central and the Balkans and Eastern Europe. And here in blue was the British colonial empire, which was basically uh, seized by the Japanese and by the English. Now there's a fifth theory that comes from AJP Taylor about democracies and preventative war. A.J.P. Taylor has found that every major war between the great powers from 1848 to 1914 was a preventative war. In other words, countries go to war because they want to stop another country from getting too powerful and ultimately attacking them. If you recall, this is the same theory that Copeland developed, uh, uh, probably derived from A.J.P. Taylor, uh, in our discussion about the balance of power. However, when England fell into decline and was largely by, superseded by the U.S. at the end of the 19th century, there was no war to mark the transition. So the reason is that power transition theory does not apply well to transitions between democracies because democracies are very reluctant to begin preventative wars. We have, of course, the big exception, which is the U.S.'s attack on Iraq in 2003 in response to suspected weapons of mass development, mass, mass destruction. We then have the last systemic or general war, the Second World War. From 1931 to 1945, it included all seven of the world's great powers. The rise of totalitarianism in Germany and Italy and Japan led to a war involving China, France, England, Russia, United States, and Brazil. At least 60 million lives were lost. The Challenger states attacked European uh, uh, colonies and colonial empires collapsed in the post-World War II period. Here you can see Benito Mussolini, the leader of the Italians. So you can see two maps here. The one on the left is the war in Europe. And uh, the map on the right is the war in the Pacific between Japan and China and the US and other countries. Now the sixth theory is Kindleberger's hegemonic stability theory and war. Sometimes a status quo hegemon declines, such as the British Empire, and another potential hegemon rises, such as the US, but there is no transition, or rather no transition uh, handover of the hegemony. Kindleberger argued that hegemons do more than exploit their dominant position to extract resources from the international system, but that the international system is a public good. And that benefits all states, and it is in the interest of the hegemon to ensure that the system continues to work. What's a public good? A public good is characterized by one non-rivalness. So there's no zero sum consequence. A gain of one state in free trade does not cause another state to become more poor. It in fact makes both countries wealthier. So it's because of the logic of the comparative advantage. States, when they trade what they're good at, are able to do much better than when they produce things that they're not comparatively good at. So if every state manufactured and exported and traded what they were good at and bought what they didn't have, collectively everyone would be better off. The second characteristic of a public good is non-exclusiveness, meaning no uh, states may benefit from trade and there's nothing you can do to exclude a country uh, from that advantage. It's like dealing with pollution. When you lower pollution, everyone wins, but you also can't stop other countries from benefiting from the drop of pollution. So some states should be responsible for enforcing navigation rules and fighting against, for example, piracy that reduces uh, trade. Here you have incidents of piracy at the end of the 20th century, and you also have a British uh, ship here fighting the Barbary pirates off the coast of North Africa.
Now, Kindleberger argues that it was the failure of the British and American hegemons to manage the international system that caused the Great Depression. And this ultimately brought unemployment that put fascist regimes in power in Germany, Italy, and Japan, and was the main cause of the Second World War. Hegemons provide two crucial services to maintain the international political economy. One, the hegemon is the leader, the lender of last resort. When the economy enters into a recessionary cycle, most private and small state lenders become reluctant to provide loans. Typically, the hegemon uh, enters and provides low interest counter cyclical loans to desperate businesses and other small states. And in the 1870 Great Depression, not the 1930 uh, Depression, but in the 1870 Great Depression, this is precisely what the English did. They extended credits from banks to keep the economy going. In the short term, the English had to pay for this. But in the long term, the British benefited because the system uh, uh, created markets that bought British goods. The hegemon is also the market of last resort. As an economy enters a recession, states tend to become protectionist to protect domestic employment by raising tariffs to keep out foreign competition. Because all follow the identical strategy, trade flows come to a halt, actually worsening unemployment in all of the states. The hegemon keeps its tariffs low to provide countercyclical market for states that can't sell their goods elsewhere, and thereby maintains the integrity of the free trade system. But, of course, it's politically difficult because the British workers lose their jobs. So it can only be done by a wealthy hegemon. So this is what the English did in 1870. In the 1920s and the 1930s, the British were unable to maintain the responsibility of being the hegemon because of their decline relative since the 19th century and the costs of the First World War. The U.S., which was the most powerful state in the international system, was, however, unwilling because of its isolationist politics of avo avoiding foreign entanglements in Europe. So the British were basically too poor, and the Americans were not interested in becoming the hegemon. So the U.S. and U.K. each tried to free ride on the other's power, which is captured by Rousseau's stag hunt game. Here you can see uh, the colonies the U.S. secured in the Caribbean and in Asia. So the U.S. was isolationist with regard to Europe. They didn't want to get into foreign entanglements, but they were definitely not an anti-colonial power. After the uh, Spanish-American War, the Americans seized Guam and the Philippines, and the U.S. landed in Hawaii uh, in order to deal with the danger that the Japanese would take it over because of the very large... Uh, ethnic Japanese population in Hawaii. So here you can see a depiction of the stag hunt, which you're going to see uh, soon enough in a game theory lecture. You have player A and player B, and the player strategies are the uh, columns for player B and the rows for player A. And it, it, in Rousseau's stag hunt, very, very briefly, you have a bunch of hunters trying to chase a deer, and if they cooperate, they catch the deer. But if the hunters suspect the other hunters are not cooperating, a hunter can always chase a rabbit and get a, get a rabbit instead. But by doing so, they leave a hole, and then the stag is going to run through the hole and escape, and no one's going to get the benefit of the stag. And because everyone fears abandonment, everyone's going to chase a rabbit. But the problem is, if everyone chases a rabbit, it makes too much sound, and so all the rabbits escape, and then no one has any food at all. So, the depression of the 1930s that was triggered by the 1929 stock market crash began as a simple recession, which is inevitable in the upswing and downswing of the business cycle. However, the recession became long and deep because of the absence of any willing hegemonic intervention to keep the recession from turning into a long, difficult depression. So, this was an entirely avoidable outcome. The 1929 stock market crash was not inevitably going to create the Great Depression of the 1930s. It was allowed to happen by great powers not coordinating how they were going to provide services, public goods, to the international system. Basically, lenders and markets of last resort. The United Nations was established at the end of the Second World War not to stop war directly, 
but to provide the institutional framework to support the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And these were designed specifically to ensure there was never a Great Depression again that would lead to fascist governments going and, and starting a war through radical foreign policies. This is the flow of oil in the world that the US Navy protects. This is the incidence of piracy 20 years ago in Southeast Asia, which again, local navies have a responsibility with the support of the hegemon to stop. Because if you have too much piracy, it's gonna inhibit trade. Now there are critics. Joanne Gawa has argued that there is no need to have a hegemon to maintain an international economic system. First of all, free trade is a myth. Hegemons do not pursue free trade, but instead they look for optimal tariffs and they use force to manipulate the system to ensure, ensure these benefits. Number two, free trade is not a public good, but it can be excludable. The hegemon excludes states from trade that do not submit to its authority in the international system. North Korea has a great many limitations on who it can trade with. States like Iran have difficulty exporting oil to certain countries that have sanctions on them, like Venezuela. Number three, smaller states can actually cooperate to maintain a public good without needing a hegemon under certain circumstances. The circumstance is called the Coase Theorem, C-O-A-S-E. And there's a fair bit of literature about how the small countries can overcome coordination problems. And the Coase Theorem shows that you don't need a coordinator or a director to achieve these outcomes. Now we have the Cold War and the Long Peace, and the Cold War is not a general war. After the Second World War, air power replaced naval power as the key to controlling the oceans. At the end of World War II, the US had over 50% of the world's productive capability. This dropped to 17% in the 1970s. It stabilized around 20% by the mid-1980s as a result of the reforms of Ronald Reagan basically bringing down tariffs and introducing foreign competition into the American market. Most of hegemonic stability literature comes about in the 1970s with the decline of the US and concerns that of what this would have for the world order, since many of the institutions like the United Nations were dependent on US power. So this raised two major questions. One, do hegemons benefit from their exploitation of the international system? Or do they become overextended and depleted by maintaining the system over time as a public good for others? And two, is the US actually in decline or not? Well, the results you can imagine, you know, the fear was that if the US fell into decline, it would cause the collapse of the UN, the IMF, the World Bank, free trade would collapse, and innumerable other organizations established under US hegemony would fail, leading to a certain amount of disorder in the international system. So you could represent this as a sort of a table here. You've got the double pessimists, that the US is in decline, and um, hegemons are losing net when they're managing the system. So here the US is losing control, and this will result in world disorder. Uh, and you know, people, uh, commentators have been commenting constantly about the arrival of the multipolar system that's going to eclipse the US. And it just, it hasn't happened yet. China's rising and India's rising, but uh, their militaries are not quite at the stage of being able to confront the US. Will multipolarity ever come? There are then the pessimists, which is that, well, the US is not in decline, but it is losing by maintaining the system. So the US will, remain in control, but it will cost. Then there are the optimists, which is the US is in decline, in a decline in terms of power, but um, by controlling, by being the hegemon, it does benefit. So the US will decline, but international cooperation will probably compensate. And then there are the double op optimists, which is that, you know what, the US is not in decline and, and it's, it's uh, gonna win by dominating the system. Joseph Nye challenged Kennedy's argument, this scholar Kennedy, who looked at the rise and fall of the great powers that we looked at very briefly in the um, Balance of Power lecture. 
And Joseph Nye said, well, you know, the powers do get, there are countries that get more powerful and less powerful, but the U.S. is special because the U.S. has something called soft power. The U.S. has cultural knowledge and reputational power that causes other countries to emulate it. I visited the Soviet Union in the late 1980s and I thought I would find a very well organized military political system but what I found was people confronting me trying to buy my jeans and they told me that they watched the movie Rambo and they all wanted to go to discos. The Soviet Union collapsed because the Russian people wanted jeans, coke and rock and roll which are uh, elements of American consumerism. And that's a kind of soft power because it's not something controlled by American leadership. But there's also the power of human rights, of democracy, and these were crucial in causing the very rapid collapse of Eastern Europe and the Warsaw Pact, Poland, East Germany, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Bulgaria. In, in about 12 months, they went from a strong working class supporting communism to mass demonstrations in the streets and to total collapse of communist governments. Now Jack Levy has indicated that there was a 0.005 probability of no war between the great powers in the period of 1945 to 1989 based on the last five centuries of warfare. Thomas and Medelsky have projected the next war to occur in 2030 based on their long cycle calculations of the fluctuations of naval power. Some long cycle theorists have proposed that nuclear weapons have broken the link between long cycles and war. And this explains the end of the Cold War without a general war between the capitalist West and the Soviet Union. Others have suggested that changing attitudes towards war, economic interdependence, and the bipolar structure of the Cold War kept the peace since the Second World War. This suggests perhaps that hegemonic cycles are not homogenous, but they evolve as they proceed, although how precisely is difficult to say. So there's some sort of learning going on. Perhaps there was never simply a power transition between, because the Soviet Union was too weak. Well, here you can see a chart of um, American and Soviet military spending and how it rise, rose and dropped. And specifically, the, the Soviets were never in a position to do a power transition. All they could do was threaten military attack. So what's next? What will be the source of power for the next hegemon? Will it be information technology like computers and the internet? Will it be biotechnology, like genetic engineering? Here you've got Khan, who's the genetically engineered warrior from Star Trek. Will it be liberal culture? Who will bring up the next best thing for the dominating culture? Is it going to be K-pop? However, it's very important. Hegemons must be able to feed themselves. Spain became desertified as it chopped down the trees to build its ships. England imported food and resisted Napoleon and the Kaiser, but in World War II, it needed help from the US in order to feed itself. Russia collapsed because it could not feed itself. Gorbachev was an agricultural engineer placed in power to revive Russian agriculture. China, if it's blockaded, could not feed itself and therefore could probably not be the next great power. India can export food, so perhaps it's a more likely candidate. So this is sort of a made-up projection by my students. I, I basically pulled my grad students and asked them, who do you think is going to be the next great power over the different centuries and decades? Uh, it's entirely speculative, uh, but it shows you ranking of military, economic, uh, technology, biotechnology, and population tech, uh, uh, levels. And this is a, a poll I had among my students by percentages, who they thought would be the next great power. Um, European Union, possibly, uh, but currently the US economy is bigger than all of the European Union put together. Japan uh, is in a steep decline uh, relative to the growth of China and the US. Germany is just one part of Europe. You've got NAFTA, 
which is possible. The per capita income today of Mexico is actually higher than China. A United Arab state, uh, an Indonesia, Israel, God's kingdom, some sort of um, uh, Christian united uh, uh, state, and Russia somehow reviving. Again, um, curious, but this list was made about 20 years ago. So what are some of the criticisms of hegemonic theories of war? Well, one, you know what? There's no evidence of war occurring in cycles, according to Geller and Singer. If you look at the time between wars or war cost, and this is uh, done on a test of the correlates of war between 1816 and 1965. Now, maybe the correlates of war doesn't have enough data to be able to make that kind of falsification. Number two, are there ideational long cycles, such as the stages and the types of religion within which hegemonic cycles are simply um, epicycles? Now, there is a, another approach, which is the issues-based approach proposed by Holsty in his 1991 book, Peace and War. Holsty rejects the power-based idea of deterrence, the power-based logic of the balance of power, and the power-based logic of hegemonic models by arguing that leaders pursue war as a result of policies. And policies are more commonly associated with issues of legitimacy. And, and behavior, consequently, is more important than power. Power-based explanations are ecological factors. They, they tell us about the general powers relationship between states, but they are not explanations because explanations must be linked to the motives of the decision makers. Ideas and ideology matter. Perceptions of justice are fundamental sources of war. Also, power-based explanations are never a sufficient cause of war. A quote, most wars, in fact, have been struggles over values, beliefs, and sympathies, and not over power, close quote. And that's a quote of his on page 330. So Holstey surveys 177 wars between 1648 to 1989, a very long series of wars. He's starting in 1648 because that's the Treaty of Westphalia, which is uh, the birth of the modern state system, when people gave their allegiance, meaning they're willing to die for the state and no longer die for the Pope. So here you can see on the left a list of issues, and then on the right you can see the columns for the different periods, and you can see the evolution and change over the centuries over why countries went to war. Now, a major variable for Holsty is the general attitude towards war among leaders, populations, and intellectuals. A major motive for conflict was revenge wars, such as France in 1815. When the British fought the Seven Years' War, they used Prussia to distract all the other major European powers. And the British were able to defeat the French in Quebec and defeat the French in India and build the beginnings of their large empire. When the American Revolution broke out, it had a very low prospect of success. The British had a, a large army and an efficient navy. So the French decided to intervene along with the Spanish. And the French intervened successfully because they told all the other European powers, we are not here going to profit. We're not going to change the territorial status quo. This is a revenge war. We want revenge for losing Quebec and India. And we are going to defeat the English, but ask for nothing in return. And this is what happened. The French deployed their navy into the North American and, and the Caribbean waters, distracted the British navy long enough for the Americans to isolate and defeat the British armies. And ultimately, the Americans were successful at Yorktown. Now, the French were eventually defeated. Their navies were eventually defeated in naval battle, but it was too late. The British had lost, and the French asked for nothing. It was a revenge war. So why would a country go to war if it was not for profit, right? So uh, in, to some extent, we can anthropomorphize a country if we can anthropomorphize the decisions by the leaders. And in some respect, Germany's war in 1939 was also a revenge war. Hitler wanted to replay World War I, but this time, 
without the chronically weak institutions of Wilhelmine Germany. So there's a question about whether faster assimilation of these states could have prevented conflict. Balance of power considerations affected alliance formation, according to Holstein, but they didn't affect what caused countries to go to war. The structure of peace agreements since 1648 has had a major effect on war by the degree to which they address the underlying issues that cause wars during those periods. Holstein did a survey of peace treaties to examine how the issues affected the structure of the treaties. Now there are five treaties here. The Treaty of Westphalia, which concluded the Thirty Years War in 1648. We have the Treaty of Utrecht, which concluded the War of Spanish Succession in 1713. The Treaty of Vienna, which concluded the Napoleonic Wars in 1815. The Treaty of Paris, which concluded the First World War in 1918. And the Treaty of San Francisco, which concluded the Second World War in 1945. He examined each of these treaties according to eight categories. The first was governance. Did the treaties provide a system by which the leaders of the countries could manage the international system? Westphalia, Utrecht, and Vienna all provided a way for the ambassadors of the countries to meet and then to have a dialogue to control the international system. The same happened in San Francisco. The Paris Treaty at the end of the World War I set up the League of Nations, but then the U.S. Uh, didn't join. So there was a system, but it was never implemented. So Hitler's rise was done against a backdrop of no diplomatic coordination. There's also the issue of legitimacy. Were the treaties seen as legitimate? Uh, in the third category, we have assimilation, which is, were the defeated countries reassimilated into the system? In all cases, they were, except again with the Treaty of Paris, where Germany was brutally uh, put under uh, uh, conditions of having to pay uh, uh, essentially an indemnity for being accused of starting the First World War. In the fourth variable of deterrent, did the treaty set up a, a set of regulations to stop the emergence of new powers? And Westphalia did. It had a, a system where if, if a certain country became powerful, it coordinated other countries to stop it. And the Treaty of Vienna also did the same thing. It had a plan to stop revolutions from occurring because it was believed that revolutions lead to chaos, which lead to Bonapartism and despotic leadership, which causes war. So you had cases where the Austrians invited the Russian army into Hungary inside their own borders to suppress a Hungarian uprising. But there was no such deterrent at the Treaty of Utrecht or Paris, or even as a part of the UN. The UN has a UN Security Council, but it's not really well structured to deal with great power conflict. Are there mechanisms for conflict resolution? Well, at the time of Westphalia and Utrecht, it wasn't thought that conflict was a problem. It's the game of kings, the sport of kings to have wars. But war came to be seen as a problem after the Napoleonic Wars because of the sheer violence that was unleashed. And countries wanted to engage in commerce and not war. So the Treaty of Vienna and the Treaty of Paris and San Francisco all saw a need for conflict resolution. As well, was war seen as a problem? Well, um, it became uh, to be seen as a problem particularly after the, uh, the end of the First World War, popularly, and at the end of the Second World War because of the scale of the violence. Uh, do these treaties have mechanisms for peaceful change? I mean, can, can they be altered? None of these treaties, except for Paris, had provisions to be changed. And in terms of future issues, none of the treaties addressed future issues. So an interesting paper would be to study whether the structure of the treaty had an effect on the subsequent uh, likelihood of, of the lasting peace.